What I realized is the moment that I got out of this, the moments of which I do get out of the center, which is not all the time, of the world in my head, are the moments when I actually become a worshiper of God. When I become part of the central story and it's about me, well, the worship is, it actually turns into idolatry. So there's no freedom in that. Um, and the gospel, the good news of God, doesn't actually start to motivate and drive me. And so it's actually uh, weighs you down, even though you think to have freedom, you need control. Um, but I've, I've found that to be true. And so here, here's the interesting thing, though. I also find that uh, it was just true for me. Even I went through all the way through seminary and went to a great seminary. Uh, every seminary has flowers and weeds in it. Uh, mine was um, rigorous academically, very rigorous in the original languages, um, extremely rigorous academically speaking. And I went all the way through that. And I have to say that I, I could identify with most Christians in most churches. And that is, I probably could not have articulated the most basic elementary storyline from Genesis to Revelation. Um, and I find that most people are in that place because we have truncated the Bible so much into systematic thought or uh, versifying it. Here's, here's how I would describe this. If you think about uh, the, I almost said trilogy, Star Wars has like 84 movies. Right? I don't know how many movies anymore. If you think about the Star Wars series, and if you, if you just think about that for just a moment, could you imagine if I had just taken one, one of the movies and I watched three scenes out of each movie and then I memorized a couple of lines out of each scene. And then I tried to tell you that I understood the whole story. You would never say that. The thing that makes any individual scene meaningful at all is that you actually know and are following the larger story. In the church, the Christian church, particularly for those of us that are more conservative, we have truncated it, and I would argue we have versified the Bible. Scripture memory is, is a value that we all hold, I'm sure, or at least you've talked about it being a value, and I would uphold that. But if you talk, ask most people, like John 3.16, for instance, a verse, a lot of us would probably come close to quoting it accurately and articulating that. But most people couldn't say what the story is that it's a part of. Most people might not even be able to say who's actually saying the words. And it's because we've versified the Bible. We've truncated it. And it's like watching a Star Wars movie. We look at some scenes, take David and Goliath out, and we dissect it and we think about it. But we have no idea how that fits into 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. We, we just don't have a picture of it. And yet we feel like we're like really mature in our faith because we can regurgitate a doctrinal statement. So I, I find that this is really uh, troubling. Um, and, and actually, I think, just robs ourselves from the, the simple... Deep commitment to basic truths that I think Jesus calls us to. Um, if you go back before the printing press, people didn't have a Bible. What did they have? The priests and the story. You know why in cathedrals they did all of the stained glass? It just told the story. And somehow, some way, we have gotten to this place where we start picking apart individual words without knowing the simple story. Isn't that fascinating? It's nothing wrong with picking apart individual words or specific verses, but when you lose the whole story, there's really no other option but making it about you. 
and we start to look at the Bible as like this blueprint for my life, and it becomes a behavior management tool versus me getting insight into who God is and what he has done and will do. That story, God's story, is what is formational in our life. I can memorize a verse and regurgitate it, and it's helpful in moments, but not at the expense without knowing the full story. That's like quoting a scene out of Star Wars and thinking like you're impacted by the whole storyline. It doesn't make any sense. And so when we, when we look at this, I, and I talk to people about this a lot of times, they're like, yeah, you know, I just read the Old Testament, and it's so hard because the language and the context, and there's like these lands that I don't understand that are there. And I'm like, have you ever read Harry Potter? Because it's new language, there's foreign lands. Have you ever read any fiction book? What happens is, is you don't understand it at first, but you keep reading and all of a sudden, you can start to articulate these different lands and the players in the land and, and all the language you start to understand over time. And because we've truncated the Bible so much, we just sit there and we kind of go, yeah, it doesn't even apply. Like, I don't even understand. It's just so confusing. I don't, I don't know Hebrew. And, th this, and then we feel like stunted. And now when I approach the Bible, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't really connect. I know I'm supposed to read it but I don't really feel like it's life-giving to me. And that's why last night I tried to give you some tips of like maybe find a, a version that doesn't have the chapter titles and subtitles and like chapter like headings or whatever that other people put in there. That's not part of the original scriptures. To try to, try to look at it a little differently as it was written originally. Just read it and don't be intimidated by that. And so for, for, for tonight, what I like to do is I like to take what is typically seen as the most disconnected section from our faith, and I want to dive into the simple storyline and then ask you at the end, do you still think it's disconnected? I want to take, actually, I'm going to walk you through in the next 15 or so minutes, I'm going to walk you through the first 12 books of the Bible. And I just want you to see the simple formation and the storyline. I'm going to spend a little bit more time in the book of Genesis than the other books, but because that's just to set a little bit of a foundation for us. And I just want you to follow, and I have some slides, and so those of you in Fireside or online, I'm not sure how this will look. Um, I've tried to not be dependent on uh, the slides simply because of this COVID situation, but... I want to show you some slides and some maps that I think will be helpful for you to understand, oh, that is what's happening here. Um, when we start in the book of Genesis, you turn to Genesis chapter 1, and we love to debate this and go like, oh, uh, and we try to make it into a science book or something. Um, it, it's not. It was never meant to be that couple things about Genesis chapter 1. If you have a Bible, turn to it, because I want to show you a few things to help you wrap your head around, your mind around, what, what God has given us here. What you see in chapter 1 and into chapter 2 of the book of Genesis is a total flipping upside down on its head understanding of the ancient world and how God and the gods worked with human beings. So as you read the text, it, it tells the story of God creating a world for people, for their flourishing in relationship with him. Now in the ancient world, this was totally upside down. The ancient world thought about the gods, the sun, the moon, the stars, whatever. In the ancient world, they always thought they had to do things specifically so that the gods could function the way they ought to. Genesis flips that on its head, at very least, suggesting that, no, God has designed this for you. You didn't do anything. That was totally life-altering for people in the ancient world. The, the second, like one of the, the other, one of the other biggest things that the book of Genesis did in the ancient world 
is in Genesis chapter 2, where we talk about the seventh day, God finished his work in verse 2 that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. In the ancient world, the deities rested in and only in a temple. So this is why if you go to, and I've been there, uh, uh, Greece and Turkey or Israel, and you look at ancient ruins, you'll see idol temples all over the place, the foundations of them. And people would go to these temples because the, the deity that they worshipped rested in and over that temple and only in and over that temple. Genesis chapter 2 is making a massive statement to the people of that world saying this God, the creator of the universe, is resting over his temple, which happens to be the entire cosmos. So it's superseding all of the other deities of which they sent, uh, uh, sought to worship. So what, what Genesis is doing here. Is it setting God up as the one true God above all over God, other gods at least. And then when you get to chapter 2, if you go there, you go to chapter 2 verse 4. It says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. If you go over to chapter 5 verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Go to chapter 6 verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. The, the book of Genesis describes the context of God's creating the world that we live in for our flourishing and relationship with him and sets them apart from all, over deity, all other deities in the ancient world and thinking and even tribal world today thinking. And then it walks through 11 generations of people. There, that's it. The book is divided up by generations. And you can follow along. You have Adam. You have, uh, you have you go on and on and on. There's 11 of them. Now when you come to chapter 3, this is where we all talk about the rebellion of God's created people. Where people start to think that they know better than God. God sets up a structure to protect relationship and the beauty and the flourishing of his people. Saying, look, I only want you to know good. If you eat from this tree, you are also going to know the other side. It's called evil. So don't do it. Now, some people will say, like, why did God even put the tree there? Why did he even give him a choice? Look, God's not after your behaviors. He's after your heart. He wants you to love him. And love is always a choice that can never be forced. So he puts the tree there and says, I want you to trust me. This is the story of God. The, God's presence and the trust of his people. You will see that. So he puts it there. People don't trust him. And they walk outside of the, his, his word and his boundaries. They eat of the fruit of the tree. And then Genesis chapter 3, you see God now removing them from the garden. They were created outside of the garden, chapter 2. Put into the garden, read it, chapter 2. They cross the boundary, break the trust, think they know better than God. And God says, okay, I'll take you back out of this beautiful world and perfect world that I've created you and flourishing with me. And then let's see how this goes. You wanted it. You think you knew better. Let's see. Chapter four, you start to read about how envy and jealousy and you actually see murder. And I made a joke last night that you fast forward to today's modern day country music. Um, all of it's a result of the fall. That and cats. So you, you get to this place where you go to chapter 4 and you see a, a family breakdown. And Cain kills Abel. At the end of chapter 4, if you look at this, uh, verse 25, after Cain kills Abel... Chapter 4, verse 25, it says, At, And Adam knew his wife again. Uh, that speaks of intercourse, obviously. And if you've ever read the book of Genesis, you will see sex and relational problems at the core of everything. We'll, point, we'll look at that in just a minute. You think sex might be an issue today. <laughs> just read, read the beginning of, God, of this whole deal. And she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, 
God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, so now their grandson, and he called his name Enosh. Now, we pass right by that. Let me just point this out. Enosh literally means mortal. So now you're getting a little bit of an insight outside of the garden where people are going to go in, huh, this is a broken world now. And this verse 26 ends off, at that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. People started to realize that maybe they didn't have it better outside of the garden. Now, when we look at this, um, we get to chapter 5, you start seeing people die of natural causes. God's words came true. Chapter 6, what you see is God rebooting the world through the flood. This is a horrifying scene. And somehow, we think it's a cute story to paint on the walls of our children's ministry wing, which is fascinating. Um, how we get to that point, I don't know. Uh, that has always fascinated me. But God is grieved at the core of his being at the continual evil of mankind. And biblically, evil is set up then as mistrusting God. So this is evil has gone their own way. And now when you start to walk through the book of Genesis, it's all setting up. You start to see in chapter 12, the Tower of Babel, and people are, are, uh, are actually kind of working together to move against God and glorify themselves. He confuses their language so that they cannot do that because it's not best for them. What is best for them is to be with him and to trust him. So he confuses their language and he, uh, he, he stops that. And then he chooses people, one family, one people, one people group, one family group to say, hey, I'm going to pass down the blessing of my presence to all future uh, generations through this one family. And this is where we come, and we come to Abram, who is married to Sarah, but then has a concubine, Hagar. Now, if you've read the story, and if you get confused by this word concubine, basically they would have servants or slaves. And a concubine was a female slave or servant of the wife. And oftentimes the man would sleep with them. And so when Solomon had 300 concubines, this is what's going on. And so in this story, Sarah can't have children. She's barren. She feels bad about it. Read the stories. It's, it's continual through the generations. They, they have, uh, Abram has a, a son with Hagar, his name's Ishmael. And if you follow uh, the, the history here, the Muslim faith ties their understanding back to Ishmael. We follow our Christian tradition, and the Bible follows the line of Isaac. And so as you read through the scriptures, you're starting to see God's going, hey, I am going to bless the world with my presence through this one family. Now, Isaac is married to Rebekah. That's also kind of a mess, if you read the story. They have two sons, Esau and Jacob. The line is supposed to go through Esau. It doesn't. It goes through Jacob. The blessing passes down in, with Jacob. You keep reading through the book of Genesis, and now Jacob has 12 sons, which then become the nation of Israel. And this is a hot mess. I mean, a hot mess. Jacob loves Rachel. Her dad tricks him. He works for seven years. Maybe you know the story. Then he tricks him and sends him Leah because Leah apparently is ugly and nobody's ever going to want to marry her. So she, he tricks Jacob. She, he ends up sleeping with Leah. She can have children. And 11 of the 12 are from Leah, and there's only one that's from Rachel, and his name is Joseph. And as you look at this, um, you go, actually, I'm sorry, there's, there's two from Rachel. When you look at this, 
Now, the book of Genesis is ending with Joseph, and J- Jake, we're told Jacob loves Joseph. Why? Well, he's from the one she, he loved. And so now he's kind of favoring Joseph. All the siblings know this. They concoct a plan to sell him into slavery, and he goes to Egypt. And by the end of the book of Genesis, what you have is a famine hit the world. Joseph is sold into slavery, but is valued by the Pharaoh and given control over this. And he has an entrepreneurial mind, and he creates land that produces grain. And when the, uh, when the famine hits the world, all the world starts to come to Egypt to get food. Well, that includes his family. His brothers go to Egypt to buy the food, don't realize it's Joseph. Joseph knows it's them. It's a wonderful story of forgiveness. And now Joseph is caring for his family in Egypt. And thus, we come to the end of the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis ends in the land of Egypt. Now, when you come to the end of the book of Genesis, if you go to the end, and you turn... Uh, in, in, ch- in chapter uh, 50, verse 26, so Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, when you go to the next book, this is a story. You're going to see this. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, is 400 years later in history. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. Do you see the story continuing? It's a story. And the book of Genesis or the book of Exodus now covers the journey of the people of God out of oppression and slavery down to Mount Sinai. It's this journey that they're going with God, trusting God under the leadership of Moses. They're whining and complaining, but this is a story about God's presence and the trust of his people. He parts the Red Sea, which is a direct impact in their minds to the flood. He frees them through the waters and then crushes the evil oppressors behind them with the waters. A direct correlation to Genesis chapter 6. That's exactly what God did to the whole world in Genesis 6. He crushes the evil of the world. And so God is reminding his people throughout history of his hatred of evil and promises that to free them from the oppressors and to give them a land of their own that they own and they will be free to walk in it without slavery. And now, when you go to the end of the book of Exodus, go with me. I'm, I know I'm flying through this. It's the basic storyline, though. If you go to the end of the book of Exodus, you'll see that through the book of Exodus, the presence of God is recognized in a box and in a tent. Very simple. It's a wooden box called the Ark of the Covenant and a tent. And they would move the tent Everywhere they went, and in the back of the tent was this holy place where they put the box. This was God's presence, and nobody could touch it, and nobody could go back there except for specific types of priests. Now, if you look at this, watch this in verse 35 of chapter 40. This is important to see. And Moses, well, let's look at verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. So as they were traveling, this cloud would move, which was God's presence. And he's just saying, trust me. God's presence and the trust of his people. Trust me, trust me, trust me. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. So there was this separation between the presence of God and his people. Now, for just a moment, skip the book of Leviticus And go to the book of Numbers. Because something fascinating happens. In chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Numbers, here's what it says. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting. So hold on a second. At the end of the book of Exodus... There is a separation between God's presence and his people. Moses can't even go into that area. And in numbers, Moses can enter. So what happens in the book of Leviticus? Well, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you. God sets up a structure 
for his people to continue trusting him in activity and to bridge the relationship through rituals and sacrifices. And it all climaxes in chapter 16 and 17 of the book of Leviticus, in the middle of the book, where you see two goats. You have a sacrificial goat, and you have this other goat called the scapegoat. And the practice of the forgiveness and the releasing of sins was given this picture of two goats. People would bring a goat or a lamb and bring it to the, the, the priest. That would, one would be sacrificed. And the shedding of the blood represented the covering of sins for the people. For a time. Never like f releasing all of the sins, just a covering of the sins. And then symbolically, the priest would place the sins on a scapegoat and that, that goat would go off into the wilderness and it would represent of a releasing of the shame, releasing of the guilt. It was gone. And so now that these rituals and sacrifices are set up in the book of Leviticus, which is actually just a one-year period of time at Mount Sinai, those are set up, the bridge between God and his, that, that gap was bridged between God and his people. And now we come to the book of Numbers, which is just about their journey up towards the land of Israel, north, until they get to Moab. Now, here's the thing about the book of Numbers that's so intriguing. It's all about the presence of God and the trust of his people. So you start reading Numbers, and you're like, what is all this? This is so crazy. Like, it's just a census. Here's the importance of it, at least a major importance of it. God is saying, I want my tent and this, my presence in the ark to be at the center of your camp so you know that I'm with you. He says, these tribes set up to the north, these tribes set up to the south, these tribes to the, at the east and to the west. I want you to know physically that I am present with you and I'm asking you to trust me. And so as they move north, and they, they, they swirl around a little bit, they get up there, and they're traveling with the presence of God in the center of their entire livelihood. You come to the book of Deuteronomy. And it's this time period at the end of Moses' life where he gets up there and he's fought with them. There's been total like anarchy against him and the leaders, uh, Aaron. And there's all this stuff going on. But ultimately, Moses has been leading them as faithfully as he can. He gets to Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy is basically these long speeches going, would you just remember God? Do you remember how he showed up? Do you remember the Red Sea? Do you remember the manna that rained from heaven? Do you remember the rock when I struck it? Do you remember, do you remember the story? Do you remember where you were at? You remember how God showed up? He's always been with us. He's always asked us to trust him. I'm just asking you to trust him. And at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, God says, you know what, man? They're not going to listen. You've got to die. Okay. He doesn't even get to go into the land based on his own disobedience. He never gets to cross the River Jordan over to Israel. This is where Joshua, his protege, comes in. And if you turn to Deuteronomy, you start to see Joshua at the end of the book. But if you turn the page, you get to Joshua. And Joshua now is going to take us across the River Jordan into the land of Israel. And they're going to take the land away from what God says is the evil people. In fact, in Deuteronomy, we have a couple of different places where God says, look, I'm not giving you this land because you're holy. I'm giving you this land because I'm evicting evil out of it. Again, a direct picture of the garden, a direct picture and reminder of the flood, a direct picture all throughout. God is saying, I'm going to evict evil out. And if you don't follow me, I'm going to evict you out too, which we know happens later. So Joshua takes him over and, it, and they, they conquer, they start taking over the land of Israel, where they are free. It's a land of milk and honey. That's not um, like cows and bees. They got honey from dates. It's, it's meat and vegetation. 
So they get to this land that's plentiful after 40 years in the desert. God's fulfilling his promise. He's present with his people and all he's asking is for you to trust me. Now the people at this point go, we need another leader because Joshua dies at the end of Joshua. We need another leader. And God goes, yeah, no, you don't. You just got to trust me. And they're like, no, we need another leader. And just like he did out of the garden, he casts them out. He's like, okay, you want another leader? Let me give you a few. And you come to the book of Judges. Let me give you a few. And so you start walking through all these judges. Some are more faithful or sinful than others. But the bottom line is, is these leaders never provide the, in a way that God actually can. At the end of the book of Judges, these are all dead. And they're going, we need another leader. We need another leader. God told them, told them that they didn't need it. But now we need another leader. And this gets us to the book of Ruth. Ruth is an amazing little story. But at the end, it all points to where the true king, the true leader will come from. Judges is really a tribal setting. And these were like military leaders more than anything else. They were still taking over parts of the land. And God says, let me just throw this little thing in the midst of this story as you're reading it as a story. Because I think he assumed that we would. And all at the end of this, it talks about Jesse, of which this king that was promised in Genesis chapter 3, that would come and evict evil once and for all, that's represented through the stomping on the, on the snake's head. This king is going to come from the, la- the line of Jesse. And so Ruth sets us up for a greater hope. But then the, the Israel becomes one nation under kings. And so you get to 1 and 2 Samuel, and you start to see this kingship of this guy named Saul, who ends up being, starts off being an all right guy, and then he's a total tool. And you read the story, and then all of a sudden, God chooses this young boy named David, a shepherd boy. And you start to watch this, the, the anointing leave Saul, and God saying, no, my presence and the blessing of my presence is now going to be passed down through this leader. And you come through First and Second Kings, and you start to just follow the kingship and the one nation of the nation of Israel. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but when I look at this, you, you kind of get past David. When David dies, you got another like four hundred years until the birth of Jesus, ish. Now, I don't know if you've ever kind of just followed the simple storyline like that, but most people are at a place where they're like, the Old Testament law doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense if you don't know the basic story. That's the only reason it doesn't make sense. If you just know the basic story, you start to dive into the book of Leviticus and you go, man, these rituals are crazy. But I understand the bigger narrative. And so now I can understand like, wow, all these sacrifices and stuff is just a reminder. And you see it totally differently. And what, what, what all of this is doing is it points to a king. That I talked about on Sunday night. That my job I feel like this week is just to point you to, to as well. As you follow along in the scriptures, you go to the gospel of Luke. And you discover the king looks very different. This is a king that didn't come to oppress people like the Pharaoh and the people of Israel are used to. But rather this king in Luke chapter 4 says, I came to free the oppressed. Think about what this is saying to the nation of Israel. Bring to liberty to you. Tying back in the story. This king is actually God himself. All throughout history, God's people were going, we want a leader, we want a person, we want a person. He knew they didn't need another person. He knew we only needed him. So he comes in the form of the person of Jesus Christ. The king was born in a no-name town called Bethlehem. This town was known for the raising of lambs for slaughter in Jerusalem. That's really it. That's literally it. There was nothing else like good about Bethlehem. They raised lambs to be slaughtered in Jerusalem. No wonder why God was born there. And that whole picture now comes alive with Leviticus and the scapegoats and the the sacrificial lamb. And this is why we understand that Jesus was called the Lamb of God. 
People envisioned this king that would be like lead with military force. And they thought they'd have prestige of walking with him. But this king goes, no, actually I came to serve, not to be served. And if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and trust me. Follow me. That's why I say Jesus never asked anybody to invite him into their life. He goes, no, you follow me. This is how this goes. You need me. You need me as God in your life. The presence of God and the trust of his people. On the cross, Jesus hung there and above his head hung a, hung a sign said, the king of the Jews. In other words, you always wanted a king and we gave him to you. He's there. He's me, God said. And three days passed and this king conquered the grave, representing a resurrected life for all people and freedom from evil once and for all. And it points to the end of the story in the book of Revelation, where he comes back and he goes, yeah, the, the serpent's head is stomped on. I did it. You didn't do it. I did it. So the, the simple story of this Bible, I would argue, is just very personal. And the more you understand the basic story of it, if you would just read it as a story, as God gave it to you, it's a narrative. And all the books, especially those first 12 that I just walked through, they're all directly connected. One after the other. And if you've never read the story, I would encourage you to do it. It's formative. It's transformative. And the more you know the basic story, the more intimate God shows up in your life. That story is all the people of God had before the printing press. Don't truncate it. Study your verses, memorize your verses, but please read the story. Otherwise, we don't know how we fit into it and we're trying to fit God into ours. And I don't think that works too well. At least it hasn't for me. So that's a little bit about the narrative, a brief picture of that. And I hope that you're motivated to at least read it a little bit more. Um, if you are a person that's been around church for a very long time and you didn't even know the simple storyline of the, what's called the Torah, the law, from, from, from Exodus down to Mount Sinai and up, and this, please don't, don't allow um, the evil to creep in and feel, help you, have you feel shame. Please don't allow that. That's not of God. That is not of God. Please don't, don't go that, to that, that place. But I, I would pray and hope that you would allow the Holy Spirit to motivate you to know God's story. And that it would be implanted deep into your heart and mind. Let, let me pray. Father, I'm so grateful for your presence. And... Um, as we look at your story and your presence is so evident. And your call for your people to trust you is so evident. And so God, I just ask that you would, you would draw us through the power of your spirit, each and every one of us, whether we're watching online or sitting in this room, you would draw us to reading and understanding your story. Free us from trying to truncate it too much and breaking it up. Help us see, illuminate our eyes through your word the way you gave it to us. Let us come to it in freedom, trusting that you knew what you were doing when you gave it to us and compiled it. We trust you through your word and in your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.